Hello again, everyone. Um, I'm back here for another plant ID hike. Um, in terms of hiking, this isn't going to be a very exciting one because I'm just walking along what's essentially uh, a roadside ditch where a road is adjacent to um, some pretty thick woods, as you can see behind me. Um, but it's pretty cool because it's a ditch that uh, generally keeps water year round. Um, and so it stays nice and moist. There's some big hills behind me, so we have some uh, springs coming out of the hills and that helps to keep the area um, pretty moist. So it stays really lush and green, as you can see, and also supports a lot of uh, different plant species. Today is June 8th, um, the day before a tropical storm hits the southwestern Illinois region in Missouri. Um, and so it's pretty windy out. Hopefully you'll be able to hear me. Um, but it's also pretty dry. So I wanted to get out before we got all this rain. Um, and the bugs get a lot thicker. Uh, because like I said, there's, there's standing water here. Running water is it's pretty buggy in general. I'm sure I'll be dive bombed by a few uh, deer flies while I'm out here. Um, but so we'll look at a variety of species, some which are uh, highly shade tolerant, some um, closer to the edge of the road, they have a lot more sun going. Um, they all generally like a good amount of moisture though. Um, so we could definitely call some of these species wetland species, um, but there will be a variety. And we're moving into the very end of spring, early summer. So we've definitely moved away from any spring ephemerals now. Um, we're kind of in this transition period where more we get more of our summer bloomers. Um, generally, our summer blooming species aren't in huge abundance in our overly shaded woods. Um, but on the edges, right along roads, you can often find more of them. So any that are blooming now or blooming early in the summer. Um, and later on, I'll be able to show you uh, some later blooming species. So we're going to head out and start walking along this ditch, see what we can find. All right, I already have one species to point out that is in full bloom right now. Um, this one is known by the name annual fleabane, um, Erigeron annuus. Uh, we have two very common species, this annual fleabane um, that blooms end of May, June, and it'll bloom quite a while into the summer, but there's also um, another one called daisy fleabane uh, that blooms, I would say, more end of April, beginning of May. Um, has probably a slightly larger flower. Um, one way to tell them apart is, is when they're blooming. First, you have uh, the daisy fleabane, and then you get this annual fleabane. But the daisy fleabane is probably going to reach a max of two feet or so. And this one that I'm standing next to is easily three and a half, actually probably a four feet tall. Um, so the annual fleabane is taller. It is a member of the sunflower family. So we have your ray and disc flowers. The ray flowers are the white ones. The disc flowers are the yellow in the center. Um, and so really, if you look at any, what most of us think of as any single flower, it's actually a bouquet of two different types of flowers. Each one, each one of these white petals is its own flower. Um, and each one of these little yellow disc flowers, it's its own flower. So it's like a one, one larger flower in itself is like a bouquet of flowers. Um, it is an annual or sorry, an alternate leafing plant. So you can see that the stems alternate their way, their, the leaves alternate their way up the stems. Um, and they do have serrated edges. Um, and they also have hairs on them. They feel pretty rough to the touch. Um, something that definitely makes this annual fleabane is you can see the white hairs on the stem and the leaves, we call those spreading hairs. They're, they're kind of longer, they go all different directions. Instead of like stout bristles, um, these would be called spreading hairs along the stem. And that's characteristic of the annual fleabane, 
versus the daisy flea bane that we would see about a month or so earlier in the year. So that's our annual flea bane. Um, they are native. Uh, people think of them as weeds because you do see them roadsides, you see them in pastures, old fields, um, degraded sites, areas that are disturbed, but they're actually, they play a key role um, in our ecosystems because they are considered to be like early colonizers. They move in easily after there's been some sort of disturbance. So we'd probably call them a ruderal species as well, like poison ivy is, that likes disturbance. Um, and being that it's an annual plant, it establishes and blooms in its first year uh, and puts off more seed. And so they help to kind of fill in that niche after there's been disturbance, which helps to prevent erosion, provides food for pollinators. It, you know, it does all sorts of really good things. Um, so even though we think of them as weedy, uh, they're not terribly aggressive and they are native. So they're pretty good, pretty good to have around and they serve a role. Right behind it, it's actually, I mean, many plants we see across the ground cover being the edge and that it's wet here. It gets a lot of nutrients and a lot of sun. So things are pretty lush. I'm going to be looking over a lot of these just to point out the ones that are blooming. Um, and this one here is really cool to see. It's not in full bloom at this point. Um, the showiest flower that I can find is this one here. This is um, a penstemon species. This one I believe is penstemon pallidus. Um, it has these really almost non-showy white flowers. Um, they're, they're maybe like half the size of a pinky nail. They're pretty small. Um, they have opposite leaves that go up the stem. So you have two leaves that come out from one point. Uh, I think we would even call these leaves to be clasping. If I can get in close enough, you see they kind of wrap around the stem. Um, so these are clasping leaves. Uh, a name for this one is foxglove or beard's tongue. Um, let's go with that name, Beard's Tongue. The common names are get kind of tricky, especially regionally. Um, if you're familiar with Penstemon, you often call it Penstemon. It's pretty mm. easy Latin name to remember. It is roughly two to three feet tall. They generally always bloom. There's probably five or six species of these in our area. They almost always bloom with whitish, maybe lightly purple flowers. Um, at the top of the plant. It doesn't do any sort of branching um, until you get up to the actual flower head itself where you see flowers are born on separate branches there. Um, these species all bloom pretty early in the summer, so May, June, maybe July. Um, and as you can see, this one's already setting seed. Actually, this one looks like maybe it's had a little bit of insect damage. That's why some of these flowers are browned. I was thinking they were the seed pods at first, but this one's had some insect damage, which is interesting. Um, not sure who's or what's doing that. Uh, but again, Penstemon, Penstemon pallidus or pallidus. Um, and that's a really cool native one too. Um, you'll see these roadsides um, especially areas that are mowed infrequently. It hangs on really well um, and it likes a good bit of sun. So that's why it's right here on the edge of the road in the woods. And behind that we can see some of the May apples left over. These are one of our spring ephemerals. Uh, I don't see any with apples on them. I'm not sure if this little patch here bloomed or not. Um, but they're definitely setting fruit or had already dropped fruit. And you can see they're starting to get yellow splotches on their leaves, um, which is pretty characteristic of this time of year as they start to fade away. Um, they're here for the summer, or sorry, here for the spring, <laughs> gone by the summer pretty much. Um, I also have another spring ephemeral here that I had shown you. Um, I would say this one was the fall Solomon seal. Um, with these leaves that kind of alternate their way up the stem and it's almost a zigzag stem. Normally they have a white flower head at the end of the stem and it's the only place that they flower. And at this point it would have berries growing on it. Um, but it looks like it's been nipped off by a deer. 
but it's still pretty distinctive. The leaves of this one, even though it's a spring ephemeral, will hang on for quite a bit, um, but they will eventually fade away throughout the summer. I'm gonna keep on walking down this ditch and see what other cool things we can find. Okay, um, we have a few different species here at this location I'd like to show. Um, the first one is still at a pretty young stage with no flowers, but it's really distinctive. Um, and this is giant ragweed. Um, it is an annual plant um, and it has this characteristic three cleft leaf. Um, gets really tall and it is the bane of everyone that gets allergies uh, late summer, early fall. In fact, that's usually the one that causes what we call hay fever. Um, and when everyone thinks that all the goldenrods are blooming and causing their allergies, it's actually um, these ragweeds. Um, they have a very nondescript flower that's kind of a yellow green flower that's very small. It's not meant to attract pollinators because this is a wind pollinated species. So its pollen grains are so light, they go airborne with the wind. That's how they move their their pollen. And so very, very easy for us to inhale that. Whereas um, the goldenrod is large, yellow, showy flowers to attract pollinators. Um, and so the pollinators carry the pollen around and it doesn't really go airborne. So it's really not, is really not what's triggering our allergies. And so this guy here, the giant ragweed, uh, not too fun, usually hated by most people. Um, its Latin name is Ambrosia trifida. So the trifida is referring to those three clefts in the leaves. Um, that is one leaf, it's just lobes so that it's in three parts. Uh, next to it, jump over here to show this one. Um, is a large plant that is probably four feet tall now that is just coming into bloom um, and has these very large leaves. You can see it's much, much larger than my hand. Uh, this is bitter dock, so it's um, Rumex obtusifolius. Uh, we also have curly dock, which is Rumex crispus. Um, but it's a little bit smaller stature of a species. But this is the obtusifolius, has huge leaves. Uh, they're always usually wavy on the edges. Uh, likes really wet areas, loves roadside ditches with full sun. Um, the red veins, pretty distinctive down the middle of the leaf. Uh, has that kind of celery-like, celery-like stem can't seem to focus on. It's got ants all over it right now. It's a little bit swollen where the leaf meets the stem. That node there is kind of swollen. Um, that's pretty characteristic. It has these really minuscule flowers that the ants seem to be all over. Um, they do have little yellow petals. Having a hard time focusing with the wind. Um, little yellow petals, um, yellowish white, I guess. Um, wind pollinated species but although like i said the ants are on it um these flower heads are pretty distinctive and when it sets seed it'll kind of turn a brownish red color so it's easy to notice these especially uh road ditches along farm fields you see a lot of this um growing in the the field margins and whatnot so that's rumex obtusifolius uh, and this one's the bitter dog it's really cool behind this one. Actually, there's cool a few cool things behind this. Um, we have one, a young bald cypress, where um, we're definitely outside of its naturally occurring range. Uh, not terribly far, but we are. Um, so bald cypress is um, more of a southern wetland species. Um, it is one of two, let me see if I could get this right, deciduous coniferous species of trees in North America. So it's deciduous, meaning that its leaves um, brown up and fall off the tree in the fall time. Um, but it's coniferous because it bears its fruit on cones. 
um, which this tree doesn't have any on it. I doubt this is even a reproducing age. This one is so young, but it has these round cones. So it's kind of like a pine tree being coniferous. Um, but there's only two species in North America that are deciduous coniferous. So it's, that's something that makes it really unique, but it's also a gorgeous tree. It's a wetland tree. That's why we're finding it here along this ditch. Um, it has these really soft, flat leaves and leaflets. Um, the bark is kind of not really good at describing tree bark, but it's like reddish, peely bark. Um, you can see more little leaflets coming out of there. Um, it'll often put up knees and there's more, there's more, um, more of these trees further down this ditch that'll have some knees. They're used for, um, stability, but they also think for, uh, exchange of, um, oxygen, um, so the knees pop up above ground, so they're not good to have in your yard or anything, um, but they help with stability and exchange of gases. So that's pretty cool. So that's, that there is bald cypress. Taxodium distichum is the Latin name. And this is cool. There's a little, um, what we call, what I call bagworm. Um, they often use um, coniferous trees to build these little homes that they carry around with them and there's a some sort of caterpillar uh, worm in there and they hook them up to the trees and I think that's where they do their metamorphosis so it's a bagworm you often see them on uh, cypress trees especially um, in more urbanized areas so further behind that there's a really unique species, which really isn't common. I don't expect many people to cross paths with this, but it's definitely worth noting. Um, it's this tall plant here. Uh, gosh, that one in the back there looks like it's a good six feet tall. Um, really, really neat plant um, called, ooh, I have to think of the common name, but the Latin name is Dasystoma macrophylla. Um, false foxglove is one of the names large flowered false foxglove and there's quite a colony of it here what's really special about this plant is that uh it's what we call a hemi hemiparasite um so it's green so it's obviously photosynthesizing on its own and it's gaining nutrients that way but it is surrounded by oak species oaks and hickories and an elm but <laughs> uh, there are oaks around and they parasitize through the fungi in the soil they parasitize the roots of the oak trees so they kind of tap into that nutrient source and they utilize that to help um, feed them essentially so I'll get in close to one I'm gonna go up to this really large one because this might be the biggest one I've ever seen um, it has these highly dissected leaves that are quite large. This one is easily a foot long, highly dissected. And then the dissections are serrated as well. I would describe the leaves also as being rugose, like the veins are deeply set in there. So it gives the leaf a lot of texture, um, kind of like topography, I guess I would describe it to the leaf. We call that rugose. Um, and they have a generally a triangular shape. The leaves start out really large at the base of the plant. They do get smaller as they move up. And you can see there's some branching that happens. Eventually, this will flower with yellow flowers. We're not quite there yet. Um, maybe I'll show you guys this again in a later video. Uh, really neat species though. Hemiparasites are always cool. Uh, we don't have a ton of plants that we can call hemiparasites. Um, and this is a really unique looking one. So that's Dasystoma macrophylla, uh, large flowered false foxglove. And we'll keep moving along here. You can see we have a lot of uh, the impatience growing. Um, this is the one with the bell-shaped orange flower. They're not yet blooming, um, but you often find growing in these habitats um, often just called impatience. Uh, another common name is jewelweed 
This one's Impatience Capensis with the orange flower. Um, I'm gonna go jump to a new spot along this ditch to so show you some different plants and we'll keep learning some more species. Okay, I'm gonna move to a grass species um, that I would call a common woodland grass species. You won't find this in totally degraded woods, um, but it is really quite common. Um, and you can see the culm, that, that, that clump there growing. We have the, um, we have a thistle growing right there, but we also have some of that uh, dasystoma around it as well. So I know it's hard to see because everything's just green. Um, but this, this grass is in bloom right now. Uh, this is called stout wood reed. If I grab a, a handful of these together, you can see them better. It's quite tall. I would say easily five and a half feet tall. It wouldn't surprise me if it could get taller. Um, and some of these actually have their anthers out, which means it's really in bloom. Uh, you can see some yellow anthers hanging. Um, that's how they're wind pollinated. So they just hang those anthers out, which have the pollen on them and the wind takes it and moves it around and distributes it to, to other plants. Um, stout wood reed, um, a common woodland grass. Uh, it's a native, so it's a good one. And you can see that the flowers hang on these very thin stems. And then this whole panicle is up in the air, but it, it really droops quite a bit. Um, very wiry stems when you get to the po this point of the plant. Um, a major way to identify grasses is right here where the leaf meets the stem. Um, if I can get in close on this one and zoom in, there's really not much to this one. Uh, you might describe it as like a slight papery, sorry, this, this connection where the leaf meets the stem is called a ligule. So you would describe this ligule as um, slightly papery. Sometimes they'll have long hairs here. Sometimes it'll be really tall, it'll be like a really tall papery ligule. This one actually has like almost a non-ligule. <laughs> um, and that's one of the ways you really help to identify grasses. Uh, you'll always see that in keys, or you often see that in keys that they, they talk about the ligule. It's kind of like talking about um, the buds on trees. Um, so this isn't a good one to teach you what a ligule is. I'll get you another one. Um, but just know that that's, that's a good spot where the leaf meets the main stem. So this is Cinna arundinaceae, uh, which is stout wood reed. And in the background, I did find some more of the penstemon that's blooming that's not terribly chewed up by the bugs. And you can see how pretty of a flower that is. Um, it's quite a bit larger um, than the chewed up ones. So that's looking really good. All right, I moved to another spot where there are much larger uh, cypress trees growing. They're clearly planted. They're all in a row. Um, so we have more here that are a lot bigger. Um, you can't find any knees right now because the vegetation underneath them is all too thick. Um, but if you're familiar with cypress, I think you probably know what the knees are. Um, big wooden knobby structures sticking out of the ground. But here we are again along a small roadside ditch that's actually spring fed, so it always has water in it. Um, I found a cool sedge species um, this one here is, uh, Scirpus atrovirens. So it is technically a sedge. Um, it is uh, called dark green bulrush though. So sedges are, are grass-like looking plants. Um, but the difference is the little saying is that sedges have edges and this one has a triangular shaped stem. It is a sedge, um, but it, it takes on the appearance of a grass. It has these blades that come off. Very typical of this Scirpus species is that the blades come off and then they like bend almost always somewhere at some point, like they're just not strong enough, they bend. We can see that it has, if I can focus, see that it has a deeply furrowed leaf, like so much so that it's it seems like it's 
been folded in half recently. Um, so it's this deep V-shaped furrow that runs down the, ooh, there we go. Deep shaped, V-shaped furrow that runs down the leaf. Um, and you can see its large flower head here, which we call rays. Um, having a hard time focusing on it again. Um, these rays shoot off on small stems and uh, that is where all of the flowers are born, which are really nondescript. Everything's green. Um, and then it also puts on the akines, which are the seeds um, of sedges. And it has these bracts. These two at the top are bracts. That again is how you identify the species. It has these two large bracts which look just like leaves at the top. So this is Scirpus atrovirens. I have another sedge species to show you. Um, and if you're not terribly familiar with sedges, they're very difficult to learn. Um, they require often a hand lens to, ident to accurately identify them. There's some that are really easily recognized and are not confused with other species. Really the dark green bull orish is that way. Um, this one's kind of that way. <laughs> not terribly though. Um, this one has these dark green. This actually already is setting the fruit. The fruit is the green part. Again, we have to do this. Um, the the brown is the fruit that's fully ripe and the green still isn't yet. So this one blooms pretty early. Um, this is another sedge. This one is um, Carex shortaniana. And it's oftentimes there's so many Carex sedge species uh, that they don't have common names. It, this one might be short sedge. I'm not really sure. Just know that it's Carex shortaniana. Um, and it, these has these long fruiting heads to them. They're very narrow. They're probably... Oh, that might be an inch and a half to maybe two, not even two inches, an inch and a half long. It really almost looks like a long linear pine cone as that fruit has ripened. And you can see some of the akines are popping off. They're almost ripe, but I'm giving them quite a bit of force. Like I said, this is a sedge, which is a carex, um, and it has a very distinctly angular triangle sedge. Sometimes it's it's roughly triangular. This one has really sharp edges to it. Honestly, almost feels like you can get a cut from it if you rain your hand up it too quickly. Um, this one only stands a foot and a half, two feet tall at most. That's Carex shortaniana, another native sedge species. Okay, I'm under a deeper canopy. You can see it's quite a dark shade of green. Um, and there's a few different species, some of which is a characteristic three-leaf poison ivy. So always remember to keep an eye out for that. It will, in sunny enough habitats, will probably be blooming somewhat soon um, with really nondescript flowers, um, but then it'll have white berries to it. And people don't often recognize the white berries. Um, so always keep an eye out for that. That'll ruin your month. Um, Mixed in with it, one that we have um, is this species here. Uh, it's not in flower quite yet. Um, I would say just at this location it's not, um, but it will be probably in flower in some more sunny spots. Uh, this is common black snake root, uh, Sinicula marilandica. Um, each leaflet is cleft um, and one thing that makes it distinguishable is here, there's a closer one here, is at the base, it's always cleft. The leaf is cleft in three, so there's three leaflets. Um, but as you move up the plant, um, it often switches to five. This one's not quite tall enough, but you can see that this leaflet actually has um, five clefts to it. That's very characteristic. So three at the bottom, five at the top. Um, and that makes it common black snake root. Um, it comes on in flowers with umbels. It's a little bit of like a ground cover in places. You can find it pretty thick. It only gets to be maybe a foot and a half tall at the most. Um, 
and it has those sticker-like seeds to it. So that's common black snake root. Uh, right next to me, I have another, um, what I would call a woodland grass, but it can tolerate pretty sunny environments too. Um, it looks a little bit like wheat, if you're familiar with uh, commercially grown wheat. Um, this one is Elemis virginicus. Um, so you can see, oh, I don't know, it varies in height. In this shade, it's only maybe two feet tall, but I've definitely seen it get three three and a half I don't know could be four feet tall it has these long awns that stick off of it just like wheat does um this is Elemis virginicus uh and I can't remember the common name of it right now it might come to me um Virginia wild rye that's the name of this one so you see those those really long awns on the flower heads very distinctive of it. This one is just looks like it's just finishing up blooming. Kind of has this bluish green tinge to it. We call that glossious. Uh, that's very common, especially in this the seed head and the flower head of the plant. Uh, we can take a look at the ligule of this plant, of this grass. If you remember, I said that's a big identifying feature. So this ligule is like is a purple color. Um, there we go. It's a purple color and it's a clasping ligule. You see those two little uh, curved horns at the either side of the leaf. So they clasp the stem and that's what's going to be the identifying feature here. So this is Elemis virginicus, uh, Virginia wild rye. All right, so that concludes my uh, forested edge ditch walk along a road. Um, it's really actually a common habitat type and a lot of the species, I'm being pummeled pummel by deer flies, um, a lot of these species are actually really quite common. Uh, I really encourage you if you ever see a cool roadside ditch uh, to get out safely, pull over safely and take a look uh, at the plant species growing there. It's really amazing how um, these edges, if they're not totally taken over by invasive species, can actually uh, harbor a lot of really neat plants and have a large diversity. Um, so that takes care of some of the wetland plants um, and common plants also that you can see in southern Missouri and uh, southern Illinois. I will see you later. Bye.